My guess is the first thing that came to mind, the love, money, security, but all those come down to the same thing, happiness. Yet what does that actually mean? When I was in AP English last year, our essays were graded on words that were so vague. The best essay score was titled effective, but of course no one actually knew what that meant. In fact, one of our review books even said, it's a popular word because it's easy to use and hard to find. It means so much and yet so little. Happiness is just like that. It's such a powerful, positive emotion. But what does it really mean? Can I be happy with a peanut butter sandwich while the girl next to me is happy with the A that she worked so hard for? I think most of us can agree that we want to be happy. But when do we allow ourselves to say that we are? The paradox lies between how we feel and how we talk about it. I encountered this in my own way one day this fall. It was beautiful weather and I had had a wonderful day. I stood at my locker after just getting to talk to two of my favorite teachers. I glanced at my boyfriend just a few lockers down and I realized I felt fantastic on the inside. The more I thought about it, the better I felt. School was under control for the first time in forever. Life at home had smoothed out. My relationship was as strong and as healthy as ever. And I could finally look in the mirror and smile at what I saw. I felt so happy, I could practically shout it to the world. But when my friend walked up, something made me hold my tongue. I felt like I couldn't mention it. That's when I realized I couldn't be happy out loud. I couldn't call myself happy despite what I felt inside. I started to look into it to see if I was alone experiencing this or if there's a bigger problem here. As angsty teenagers, we know that this period in our lives isn't easy. It's a time for formation, growth, and change in all aspects of ourselves. From a psychological perspective, the psychologist Eric Erickson established the base stages for how personality develops and expanded it into adulthood. He believed that in their psychosocial growth, adolescents go through a period of develop, developing their identity. This process to do is hard while we're surrounded by so many other people who are all doing the exact same thing. But why is that? Well, all teenagers struggle with this. And what gets in their way pretty universally is comparison. We look to others as a benchmark for how we see ourselves. And I found that in my research and my own experience with high schoolers, this becomes especially problematic in three big spheres. One of the most evident spheres is academic achievement. How good your grades are. For example, BASIS is an extremely challenging school. Students here are constantly put to work. And often that work comes with numerical results. And because we're curious and slightly competitive beings, we like to compare scores. Though I thought about how all through middle school and high school, I haven't wanted to share my grades. It didn't feel good. What I found is that's part of a trend that starts from when we're much younger. In the United States, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, says that a student or a parent must give permission in order to share the student's grades, unless it's for an organization with a legitimate vested interest, such as the principal or National Honor Society. Our grades are kept secret as we're discouraged from telling other people, helping a teacher by handing out tests, or even getting report cards back in non-sealed envelopes. Both legally and culturally, we're taught to be different, but quietly. Although class rankings and academic awards make it apparent who the higher grades. This can be difficult because we don't like to see others do better than us, but it's tough to be on either end of that dynamic, whether you're the one that does worse or better. No one wants to feel disliked for doing well. More than that, tests like the PSAT, SAT, and ACT add on to the difficulty because they're inherently part of a competition for college where scores matter. It's not the end of the world to get an unsatisfactory grade, but by looking at their results in the context of everyone else, teenagers are much harder on themselves. While they play a big role, it'd be a bit ridiculous if we thought high school was just about academics. The social lives of teens are just as, if not more important, than their in-class performance. High school is a bustling environment where relationships make up a central component, whether they're with friends or a significant other. The idea of being popular is a base for comparison. It's become extremely apparent in social media, where the lines between real and online life become blurred. 
In the Teens and Social Media Overview of 2015, the Pew Research Institute found that the median number of followers for a teenager is between 150 to 200. So when someone has a number that's higher than this, it looks like a sign of popularity. To put this into perspective, I only ever had about 50 followers on Twitter, while Kim Kardashian has 46.2 million. In a different report in August of 2015, Pew found that 39% of teens using social media feel pressure to post content that will gain them likes or followers, trying to win bigger, better ratings. As a result, tags appear such as like for like or follow for follow, where teens offer a trade-off to help each other in this numbers competition. Let's not forget, however, that social media isn't just about who sees the post, it's about what you post. A whole other presence of this online face is romantic relationships, which becomes so much more apparent because teens often post about them. The ability to show off a cute date is more valuable online, and a lack of romantic interest hardly goes unnoticed. It adds under the pressure to be like others, to have that special someone. Although social media doesn't necessarily translate into real life completely, it's become a whole other realm to compare personal relationships to other adolescents and reflect back on ourselves. But no matter how many likes we may get on a photo, that positive feedback doesn't necessarily translate into a healthy body image. We know that we post isn't fully real. It's edited, it's adjusted, and we put ourselves out there to be seen when in reality, our view of ourselves may not be stable and healthy. During and after puberty, bodies change a lot. And with that, how do you view them? Adolescence is really the first time that people become aware of their bodies. Not only what they see themselves, but what they think other people see. The biggest challenge posed to a healthy development of body image is the mass bombardment of media that we face, that generations before, before us haven't experienced in the same way because of the pervasive nature of the internet. In 2015, the Pew Research Institute found that 92% of teens go online daily and 71% go on multiple social media websites. Include all that exposure online with TV and magazines, that's a lot of images, most of them with the same idea displayed, the ideal body. Victoria's Secret models are a prime example of this, with skinny bodies and appealing physical attributes shown as the epitome of sexy. Hollister is guilty of the same thing. They hire fit, muscular men to walk around their stores shirtless, showing off what attractive is supposed to look like. There's no escaping this, and all of these images come together to form this societally perfect body. The worst part is teens look themselves mainly for the flaws. A study done in 2014 by Florida State University had a group of women go on Facebook for nearly 20 minutes, and afterwards, they had noticeably increased body dissatisfaction as compared to a group who had to simply research rainforest cats. <laughs> if we expand our scope, this happens outside of just the media, it's every day in person. We look at the outfits and the bodies of others and how they compare to our own. I remember walking into the bathroom at school one day and thinking, wow, man, you have to stop forgetting that you really aren't cute. As I turned to the side to look at myself in the mirror because I'm not skinny, I don't fit the body brand. It was a disgusted feeling I was all too familiar with. Although there has been recent movement to change this type of media, Dove has created commercials with women who aren't models and have no photoshops. In addition, Barbie just came out with new, more varied body shapes of their dolls. But it took them almost 60 years to get there. These steps forward in a new direction are important, but teens are still suffering in the way that they view themselves. What's been done isn't enough. I know the struggle myself, and most every other teenager I know shares this feeling that their bodies, their bodies aren't and never will be good enough. So why is it so hard for teens to define themselves? Well, after my research, all my observations pointed to one thing. It's comparison. In trying to focus on ourselves, we get lost in looking at others. We look to them as benchmarks for how we think we should be and are doing in our process of self-development, but that undermines the entire goal. In 1954, the social psychologist Leon Festinger took a look at this phenomenon and created one of the most important social psychology theories today, revolutionizing how we looked at how people respond to the world around them. He defined this as social comparison theory, which still holds up today and is the search for and utilization of information about other persons 
standings and opinions for the purpose of self-assessment, judging the correctness of one's own beliefs, opinions, and capabilities. We check ourselves based on other people. That's what he found. So we're not crazy for doing this, and we're not alone. But just because Bessinger is able to explain this doesn't mean it has to dictate how we think. If we stopped comparing ourselves to those around, we can appreciate our academic success within the context of our own achievements. If we stopped comparing ourselves, we could define ourselves within our friend group and stop obsessing over who is more popular. If we stopped comparing ourselves, we could appreciate our bodies as the individual beauties that they are, regardless of how they fit the idealistic images or compare to those around us. We have to put the emphasis back on ourselves. But how do we refocus it on our self-worth? Well, positivity has a lot to do with it. By using a positive mindset, we can begin to change the way that we look at ourselves. First, we have to change the way that we talk to ourselves. Are the thoughts inside our heads kind? If not, filter them to reward them. If a teenager thinks, ugh, I suck at math, she can pause and change it to, I'm glad I'm learning what it's like to really be challenged. It's the same base content, but taking the edge off the thought, we begin to change the way that we look at ourselves, especially the more we engage in this positive self-talk. David Sarwer, the clinical director for the Center of Weight and Eating Disorders at University of Pennsylvania, has put this into practice with his own patients, trying to change their mental image of their bodies. Second, each day we need to list three things that we're grateful for about ourselves. Whether it's about our bodies or our achievements, or whatever it is that makes us who we are as individuals. By changing the way that we act, whoever we can we can look at them through the lens of compassion. The political commentator Sally Cohn developed her understanding of compassion through being a liberal talking head on Fox News. She defined compassion as being able to appreciate and validate someone else's experience, even if it isn't our own. We have to look to those around us and embrace their experience. We have to accept that they're different and support them for that. Luckily, a counselor and life body coach for my wellness, Michael J. Formica, wrote in Psychology Today about a few ways that we can do this. One of the first ways is to realize that it's really not about us. What goes on in the lives of others is separate. They're on their own path. With that, we have to step into their shoes. I know that phrase is cliche, but maybe it's not as cheesy as it sounds. By taking into account someone else's perspective, we can learn to accept it and release our expectations that we hold for them and for ourselves. Last, we have to accept that our, di our differences, no matter what they are. I have a friend who owns a company, another who, who is the most hilarious and captivating young woman I've ever met, and one who's internationally ranked in Taekwondo. Compared to them, I just don't measure up. Compared to them, that is. That's the point. By looking at them through a filter of comparison, all I feel is inadequate. I simply am never going to be like them. But I don't need to be. I have to look at it from their eyes. The boy who owns the company, his brain is wired for technology in a fascinating way. The girl who's so funny, she uses humor to connect with people of all different kinds. And the young woman who's so good at Taekwondo, it's her way of saying, take that to what life throws at her. With compassion, I can see that, and I can accept that's helping them to define who they are. By exhibiting compassion towards those around us, not only will it allow them to form their own self-image, but it will also take the pressure off of us internally to measure up. As I said before, this won't happen in an instant. I don't expect anyone to walk out of here thinking he or she now knows the secret to being instantly compassionate and appreciative of his or herself. Instead, it's process. And maybe the first step is listing the three things that you're grateful for and realizing that other people really don't have much to do with you. Next, consider why someone approaches the world in his particular way. By beginning to change how we act, we can change how we think. AJ Jacobs is a journalist for the New York Times who specializes in trying new things. And he found that, in his own words, I always thought you change your mind and you change your behavior. But it's often the other way around. You change your behavior and you change your mind. The saying, fake it till you make it, isn't as much of a pep slogan as we thought. By, like Jacob's found for himself, by embodying what we want to be like, we can change the way that we think, even if it doesn't feel real at first. 
The hardest part will be overcoming our inhibitions and in being compassionate for the people that we don't know. But by acting the part, we can start to become it. This is the time for teens to define themselves and create a healthy self-image, how they see themselves as a whole. By looking to those around, a chance at a healthy self-esteem and self-confidence are completely undermined. So we have to stop comparing ourselves. This isn't only for teenagers, it's for everyone. The starting this process as an adolescent is crucial, but as adults, it's still important to achieve a healthy self-image. By exhibiting compassion towards those around us and embracing the positives within our own being, we can be vocal about our happiness, and so can everyone else. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.